Hmm. We're here in St. Aldwin's Church in the heart of Old Dublin. The church was built by the Anglo-Normans in the 12th century and it's the last remaining parish church still in use in the city. It was dedicated to St. One, the Bishop of Rouen, in, who was a Bishop of Rouen in the 7th century. Now, I'm standing beside the tomb of Roland Fitz Eustace, the first and only Baron of Port Leicester. And he's here carved with his third wife. Roland was a member of the Fitz Eustace family. They were given vast tracts of land in East County Kildare, West County Wicklow, when the Normans arrived in Ireland. Roland himself, uh, came from a family of um, lawyers. His father was uh, Edward, and he was the Lord Deputy of Ireland, the King's main representative. Roland was born around 1430, studied law, and became a barrister. He eventually became the Lord Chancellor of Ireland, which meant he was in control of the legal affairs of the country. That gave him the control of the Great Seal of Ireland, and the act passed by the Irish Parliament had to be stamped with the Great Seal. He also had powers to convene Parliament and to stand in for the Lord Deputy if the Lord Deputy was indisposed. A very powerful man, a great ally of the Fitzgeralds of Kildare. His power was such that uh, at times he, he uh, stretched it a little. Like many of the Irish Lords, uh, they felt they were like the proverbial big fish in a little pond. London is a long way away. Um, sometimes Irish lords got away with uh, things that English lords would find themselves behind bars or even without their lives. Roland, for example, twice was charged with, with treason, but on both occasions got a royal pardon. And I suppose the pardon was given because uh, the royalty and government in England needed to deal with somebody. So if it wasn't Roland, it was some other character of similar hues. So it was easy to deal with him. For example, he's... Son, his son-in-law uh, was Gareth Moore Fitzgerald. Alison Fitz Eustace married Gareth Moore Fitzgerald. And Gareth Moore was another of these upstarts. Uh, for example, when accused of burning a chapel on the Rock of Cashel, uh, he was asked why he had done so. And his uh, response was, I did so because I thought the Archbishop was in it. Of course, this incensed the Archbishop. And uh, reports were sent to, to London. They were all summoned in front of the King. And the Archbishop, of course, said, look, this man is impossible. He, all of Ireland can't control him. And of course the king's response then was, well, perhaps we let this man control all of Ireland. And he appointed him Lord Deputy. So these are the kind of people you're dealing with. Uh, tree marriages, and that wasn't that unusual in the Middle Ages. Uh, people died young, so they married often. Um, life expectancy was much shorter than ours. Um, Roland is Marguerite's third husband, and Marguerite is his third wife, so five marriages b between them. Roland finally became adrift from authority uh, when he took the wrong side in the War of the Roses. In the War of the Roses in the uh, 15th century in England, um, two sides fought it out, the House of York and the House of Lancaster, to see who should control the, the, the monarchy. The Irish, for the main part, took the house of the side of York and even supported one of the Yorkist candidates, Lambert Simnel. Lambert was a boy of nine or ten years of age, and he was brought over to Ireland by the Yorkists, and the Archbishop of Dublin, with the aid of a crown borrowed from the statue of the Virgin in St Mary's, in Christchurch Cathedral, crowned him King of England. And they paraded him through the streets of Dublin as the new king. Then, with the, a number of Irish lords, they took sail to England to take the throne. The Lancastrians, of course, had different ideas, and they met them at Stoke and Trent, where a major battle ensued. Uh, the Lancastrians were victorious, and Lambert, the boy, was taken prisoner. And Henry, the new king, Henry the Seventh, the first of the Tudors, insisted that Lambert be brought back to his palace in London, and he set him up in his kitchen as about the lowliest servant in the kitchen, to emphasise uh, the fall from grace. You were claiming to be king of England. Guess who's king of England now? But for the Irish. Their loyalty is now utterly suspect. Roland's great seal is taken off him after a struggle. Most of his powers are taken from him. But one of the great powers which he had held for 38 years was that of Lord Treasurer. He had control of the finances of the country for 38 years, an amazing span of time in the Middle Ages to hold any post. 
And towards the end of his life, um, he, what really annoyed him was that some of his enemies dared to suggest that his powers of accounting left a little bit to be desired. So there were rumours of a tribunal in the offing to investigate how he had dealt with those finances over the 38 years. He had one more trick up his sleeve, he died. So we'll never know what the cause was. We can just um, give him the benefit of the doubt. At the time, though, it wasn't possible to bury him here because of that intrigue. He had built a little chapel here, which we call the Port Leicester Chapel. He constructed that in 1455 in thanksgiving for being saved from a shipwreck. He had this carved in 1482 when Marguerite died uh, and he had himself carved beside her, but he's not actually buried here. Uh, he's buried in the old New Abbey in Kilcullen, uh, which he had um, been a benefactor of, and he's he died in 1496 and buried there. His family put a similar effigy over his grave, and until quite recently that effigy was out of doors, much more worn than this. But this area here tended to fill with rainwater, and if you lived near that part of Kildare and you had warts, you went to the effigy armed with ten pins, dropping nine of them into the water, the tenth one over your left shoulder, saying a few prayers, and by the time these pins had rusted, your warts should have disappeared. A bit fanciful. As is the story of the little dog here. This little dog here is asleep, and the conclusion that people had when you had a sleeping dog at a night's foot or feet was that the knight had died in his own bed, surrounded by his family, a peaceful, happy death. Whereas if the dog is absent, or particularly if the dog is snarling, it would be an indication that the knight had died in the battlefield. It doesn't really work here, because Roland had, had this carved 12 years before he died. Perhaps because of his age, he presumed he was going to die in his bed. But I think the dog here is uh, no more and no less than a symbol of loyalty. It's Roland expressing his loyalty uh, to his good wife, Marguerite, to his king and to his god. <laughs>